President, fellows and guests, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to reintroduce the Reverend Pettit to the society. During his lifetime, he was nationally famous for both his art and for his architectural writing, and sadly has been practically forgotten for both. So in order to cover both subjects adequately, I'm going to be very brief with biographical details. The bulk of the talk will be showing you examples of his art and highlights from his writing, and for both, you will see that Pettit stood against the historicism, which is still called by some the spirit of the Victorian age. I should add you'll be seeing about a hundred pictures during the talk. Except in the art section, they'll be without comment, such as this of Rochester, and are here just to show you more e examples. All pi pictures are by Pettit, except where stated in bold. So, to get started, <coughs> Pettit had no difficulty in resigning from the curacy in 1834 at the age of 33, being the eldest son of a wealthy landowner and vicar. He um, married but had no children, nor, nor did his brothers. Four sisters accompanied him, one of whom worked closely with him, and she's responsible for the posthumous publications that were done. Three articles in the Archaeological Journey uh, journal and a long unfinished poem called The Lesser and the Greater Light which attempts to reconcile belief in God with science and I only mention that we don't have time for it today just to show you the range of Pettit's talent. More, more importantly in 1869 the year after his death the architectural exhibition in Conduit Street gave up over one half of its space to a display of 320 of his pictures. His pictures had never been sold by him, he never tried to, his family never tried to. After that, they disappeared for 120 years. I'm going to be showing you five groups, the first three of which are all from the early period, from the late 1820s to around 1842, which you'll remember is still the golden age of British art and of watercolorists in particular. This group, uh, the whole of the early art to 1842, is special because unlike later works, they were never shown. They were stuck in albums and only came out in the last 20 years. Whereas the later art was exhibited and some of it even escaped from the hoard which was then locked away for 120 years. The first of these groups are the early landscapes from the 20s to the mid 30s. These albums were bought by John Abbott of Abbott and Holder 20 to 30 years ago. And he wrote that Pettit is comparable to De Wint and the avant-garde impressionist school of British watercolorists. De Wint is then the first of three important influences on Pettit, which I'll mention, but I'm not sure if they met. However, I want to draw your attention to the buildings. In the 1820s, is there you see on the left, they're rather flat at, at St. Leonard's, whereas here, Canterbury Cathedral, four years later, is much stronger and full of texture. That can be dated to 1832 because it shows the Norman Tower there on the right, just in the process of being taken down. The texturing and strength of the buildings seems to come directly from Prout. Samuel Prout, of course, less well known, one of the most popular watercolorists in the 1820s, specialized having developed this te technique in it and later became watercolorist to the king. Prout and Pettit knew each other, praised each other, and exchanged pictures. Here, Pettit writes, he went to the same spot of the iconic picture, the Stadthouse in Ghent, that I showed you, to paint the same view, but notice the differences. Whereas Prout includes people, a marketplace, 
and harmonizing splashes of color to create the overall romantic view, Pettit disdains all of that to focus on the architecture, and his mood at this time is bleak. This is his, what I call his monochrome phase, and it's his first distinctive and original style, more so than the previous one, clearly. An important subgroup during this period are his shipping pictures. Here are two from Harwich, very near where he was working as a curate at Bradfield, and one from Rochester, just a short uh, boat ride. But a subgroup more important that I want to show you are his pictures of the black country mines and factories, stark and without caricature. These are said by the Black Country Living Museum to be the earliest known pictures of such scenes. Yes, Turner and others had painted romantic views of Dudley Castle, but this is many de decades before Butler Bayliss and later Lowry around Manchester found artistic subjects in such scenes. The left-hand picture is the one on the left in front of you here. Monochrome pictures continue into the 1840s, but around 1837, Pettit starts developing a much more colorful style, and this is the third group to show you. It seems to have been developed during a three-month trip around Ashbourne, Derbyshire. This tree, for example, was drawn three or four times in different colors and the colors are much brighter and more vivid here on my screen than you can see there. It's got a beautiful bright blue and yellow. The purpose was to develop the tools to present the beauty of churches for his first book, which was going to come out in 1841. Here are several from the UK which didn't make the final cut. Different palettes, but all with the same exuberance and all lacking a bit of color. The left-hand one of Ashbourne was the one used in Europe. Here you see two of Sant'Ambrogio in Milan, one of which was selected for illustration. On the right at the bottom, you see that the illustration exactly matches in every detail the watercolor. Pettit did nearly 300 illustrations for the book, so if you add in the number of uh, churches that didn't make it, and the multiple pictures of the same one, that's quite a large volume. The exuberance of the style gradually reaches its peak in Normandy on the way home. So here, for example, Norrie Church, just outside Caen, and you'll see more later when I talk about the book. There are also a few landscapes from these journeys. Here are two. On the left, a little building at Villa Franca near Nice, which is the second picture in front of you there. But it's the one on the right that I want to draw your attention to, the very quick impressionistic way that he's captured the mountains and that in 1839. <clears throat> that completes an introduction to the three early groups those who are aware of some of his later work are usually surprised by the style and the finish and the color. Later work splits into two groups, what I call the architectural sketches and finished work. If Petted is known at all, it's for architectural sketches because quite a few were given away in his lifetime and on his death. The key features of an architectural sketch a minimal background, minimal foreground, or sky. They can be seen as portraits of buildings in the same way that artists might do portraits <coughs> of people with a neutral background. Pettit himself would say this, it's as necessary to know the effect of a building as the means by which the effect is produced. Plans and drawings show the means a sketch shows the result. Effect was a more loaded word in Victorian times than, our, than in our times, carrying the um, implication of the emotional impact, the impact on the viewer. One subgroup of these I want to draw your attention to are his ruins of Gothic abbeys from 1845. 
such as this is a Crowland Abbey. Ruskin, of course, coined the word savage in 1852 to describe Northern Gothic, but more as a quality to be sought after, whereas Pettit sees the savagery of the society that created these wonderful buildings as something one would not wish to recreate, and in trying to recover the architecture, one ends up with just lifeless copies. A further illustration of this is a comparison of Byland Abbey, as painted by Girton, lacking a bit of green, and uh, Pettit on the right, lacking a bit of brownish red. Girton, of course, um, shows a romantic view of the Gothic with the added greenery, the kind of picture that would encourage someone to build a ruin or a folly in one's es estate. Pettit is bringing out the violence associated with the architecture. The left-hand picture, of course, is highly commercial and always was, but among those I've shown this comparison to, I'm by no means alone in thinking that the right is less quaint and more accessible to a modern eye because of the drama. Another from these, uh, this series is Whitby, which is the third um, uh, here in front. This set of architectural sketches are as part are of a small part underground church, St. Radegond near Tours, now in fact well within Tours, you see Tours Cathedral in the background of that one there. They were done to illustrate the paper that, submitted, that Pettit submitted to this society in 1852 on becoming a fellow. There were five watercolours which he brought along to lie on the table as he read his paper. So three I've brought back now and are lying on the table there. Of course you were in Somerset House then, but perhaps the table might be the same. Now look at this watercolour of Crystal Palace side by side with Philip Delamotte's photograph. <coughs> Delamotte, of course, was a pioneer of photography in Britain. From the early 1850s, <coughs> photography would rapidly come to be used in architectural <coughs> studies. Pettit was a supporter of photography, commissioned and used it in some papers, and saw it as complementary to his art especially for close-up of architectural detail. As pictures, the architectural sketches are different to conventional compositions, but can be evocative in a way that art without a full color range can be, and they can capture the dignity and character of a church more than a complete scene. I think over 2,000 sketches have survived, which would be an extraordinary portrait gallery of medieval churches from across Europe as they were in the 19th century. Let's move on to the last group, finished art of the later period. Most frequently these are a building in its setting, but there are quite a number of pure landscapes, such as this rock of Torquay, or this Welsh view, or the view of Soma over the river. But showing the church in its setting is the main subject of Pettit's completed pictures. They were all to be exhibited at his lectures to complement and leaven the architectural <coughs> sketches. Clearly their post-turner, the third influence I've mentioned for Pettit, because of their treatment of light and the atmospheric effect, but still distinctively Pettit. The date here is 1855, and I need to mention just a little bit of context. At this time in the mid-50s, British and French art were di diverging. We doubled down on the historical romantic theme with the pre-Raphaelites supported by Ruskin, while Impressionism was going to emerge a little bit later in France. In terms of composition, if you see a connection in the refinement detail and composition between the um, uh, romanticism of Prout and the pre-Raphaelites and the impressionism of Turner and the impressionists, that's not a 
coincidence. Petit, of course, falls firmly on the right-hand side. Litchfield appears to have been his training ground or studio. <coughs> From a lecture on refinement in architecture, he writes, no true artist, whatever be his branch of art, will rest content without doing something towards its improvement, either in developing duties or in correcting faults. And you can be sure that he would have applied that to his art, otherwise he would not have said whatever that branch of art. He painted Litchfield over a hundred times from every angle in every type of weather, and at least half have probably su survived. And again, the colours are not <coughs> coming out at all there, sadly. Um, <coughs> Fifteen or so are in the book with good colours. Also on the table is the first picture that I showed there, which is the cover of the book, as you can see in the top right hand corner. A few more examples from France. So Litchfield was his studio, which he then took on his journeys each year, the techniques so as to then do it, um, do similar pictures elsewhere. Here are two from France and one from Iona in Scotland. The question that I want to pose is whether Pettit doesn't achieve something special in the space after Turner and before Impressionism, the space vacated by the pre-Raphaelites when they went on their historical move. So, I've given you a quick introduction to five groups of Pettit's art, and I hope that it demonstrates at least that Pettit deserves to be taken seriously. And I've explained that people have never heard of him as an artist because his pictures were never sold by him or his family. What happened was in uh, 1953, his great niece died in an old house in Surrey, and the entire hoard was abandoned in an outhouse to new owners. They held onto it for 15 years, and then it appeared at Sotheby's Billingshurst over the course of the next 12 years. The auctioneer could think of nothing better to do than to group them in lots of 100 to 300 at a time, and worse than that, mixed with pictures of his sisters. 20% of the later works are actually attributable to his sisters. To give you one example of that, here is uh, 22nd September 1856, Pettit and his sister Emma sitting side by side. If you particularly focus on the building, you see the left-hand one is strong and substantial, while the right-hand one is not as good. But let me finish with two testimonies so that you don't think it's just one lone fool trying to advocate Pettit. First of all, uh, from his own time, Philip Delamotte, we saw the pioneer of photography, later became professor of art at King's College, tutor to royalty, and wrote The Art of Sketching from Nature, i.e. watercolours outdoors, in 1888, 20 years after Pettit died, so no obligation at all to mention Pettit. He included examples from nine of the great watercolourists, Turner, Kopman, Gertin, Cox, Varley, and so forth, and Pettit. So he put Pettit in the highest company and especially praised his architecture and shipping. Secondly, the only modern independent comment about Pettit in the review of my book of, in the British Art Journal in summer this year, most accomplished watercolour artist, remarkable natural feeling for composition, perfectly capable of producing the most refined and highly finished watercolours one could wish for. Right, that was the easy bit. Now you have to continue, please, to look at the pictures while I talk to you about Pettit's views on architecture, which is much more complicated. If you can absorb both simultaneously, then you feel the range of Pettit's achievements. Pettit's architectural career runs from 1841 to 1868. 
and I'm going to touch on just a few things from three different periods. First of all, his battles against the extremism of the supporters of Gothic in the early 40s. Secondly, uh, in a little interim period where he focuses on widening the range of accepted styles. And lastly, I particularly want to draw your attention to his modern progressivism during the later battle of styles, and there I'll include the few examples of his own designs. A bit of context is essential here. By the early 1830s, Gothic had already established itself as the primary architectural style for churches. And it was given a further big impetus by Pugin publishing his first major book, Contrasts, to use its abbreviated title, as Rosemary Hill notes in her recent biography, it's more of a manifesto than an argument for building in 13th or 14th century Gothic. But 1835 was also the year of a much less well-known now essay on architecture by Thomas Hope, published a few years after he died. It advocated a forward-looking, eclectic approach to architecture. Pettit's work goes further along that line and against that of Pugin's. But it was Pugin who was inspiring, not just to architects, but to a group of Cambridge undergraduates who formed the Cambridge Camden Society in 1839, intent on reviving all aspects of the Anglican church inside and out. They were like the stormtroopers for the use of one correct style of Gothic architecture, especially aggressively from 1839 until 1845 under their founder, John Neal. Gilbert Scott would later say in his recollections, you can see the quote there, architects would be blacklisted from church work if they didn't follow the ecclesiologist line. So the first period is this battle against the dogma of the Cambridge Camden Society. Pettit did a lot of things during the, the decade. I have to spend quite a bit of time on the book because it still stands as a significant and widely underappreciated work. And I must add a word or two of balance about St. Mary's, which is mentioned a few times, but not completely. Remarks on Church Architecture came out in 1841 and was highly praised by established media, not surprisingly two volumes, nearly 300 of illustrations all of places which generally were not the most common ones people were from, from familiar with. So a tour de force. In Pettit's own words, the objectives, I've done my best to set before the reader sufficient variety in form and composition to prove to him how wide a range can be taken. So directly against Pugin's call to focus on a particular narrow range of Gothic, he continues, the builder will thus learn not to imitate but to invent, to mark the period of his labours by a style distinguished from that of his ancestors otherwise than by its meagerness and deformity. So, in recommending originality and, the in, and to invent, Pettit is proposing something which is directly against what the ecclesiologists had just six months or a year before set themselves up to impose one correct style which they wanted to uh, decide on and all based on English models, whereas half of Pettit's illustrations are foreign models. And they even in one of their criticisms said beauty should play no part in church architecture or at least not as a criteria, whereas for Pettit, beauty was fundamental to what he was wanting to propose. Those were some of the immediate issues, but I want to quote you one passage out of many which shows that the book also previews issues that would come to the fore much later. If it were asked which of the buildings of the present day bid fairest to command the admiration of posterity, I should answer without hesitation those connected with our railways. Bridges, viaducts, perfection of mechanical beauty can any of our modern ecclesiastical buildings compare with these? 
Well, criticism, as you can imagine, from the ecclesiologist and then counter-criticism from the Christian rem Remembrancer and other journals went on for a full two years to 1843. Later, that wouldn't be quite a phenomenon as it was then. This was the first major uh, battle. Uh, but I want to jump to um, Edward, pro later Professor Freeman's, who wrote his own history of architecture in 1849. From these two authorities, I hope and pet it, I've learned far more than from all other architectural writers put together. Hope signaled the direction, Pettit had beaten the path. So for Freeman and others, this was the most important book on architecture by a living author throughout the 1840s, and sadly, it's not recognized at all. This catapulted Pettit to the center of the debate as the leading conservative voice against the dogmatism of the age. We don't have time to talk about those first three issues that I've mentioned, but we do need to touch on the fourth, preservation of ancient buildings which Pettit advocated versus destructive restoration, i.e. when you restore an old church building, you put it into the one correct style. This leads to the Battle of St. Mary's, which is only partially represented. So the short story here, Gilbert Scott, early in his career, commissioned to restore the St. Mary's Church in Stafford, proposed and, as you see, eventually went ahead with this uh, Gothic-imposed uh, roof on the south transept, which Pettit and others who taught like him thought would destroy the character of the old church shown by his watercolour there in 1841. Quite remarkably, this was put for resolution to the Architectural Society at Oxford and the Cambridge Camden Society. That's a bit like one of the legal battles concerning Brexit being given to the Vote Leave campaign to decide. The Oxford Society was similarly minded, but without the level of intrusive badgering of all and sundry like that in Cambridge. Exactly how that such an absurdity came to be agreed by the rector and the donor is not at all clear. But that's not the main point I want to make. Uh, this is what Scott had to say. He wrote about it twice later. First of all, in a book in 1852. These were early days of church restoration, cannot claim credit for acting on any uh, defined principle, not without effect on the minds of others. So pointing out, first of all, it's a, an admission of doubt, which for Scott is extremely rare, I can assure you. And secondly, it points to the significance of the event. And secondly, when he's attacked by the anti-restoration movement at the, uh, in the 1870s, I can hardly say that this movement is new to me, for I was assailed on the same principle by Mr. Pettit in 1840 and 1841, pointing out that this is the first major incident. So, of course, preservation had been an occasional issue since the 18th century. Many antiquarians had opposed changes, but as the Gothic revival got going, Pettit was a major public figure opposing the um, uh, changes to the medieval churches in his book, where there was a whole chapter, this example, and other writings too. Let's move on to the second period. <clears throat> By 1850, the immediate issues that we noted had all gone Pettit's way, by no means just because of Pettit. Neil's extreme position had gradually become isolated, and he was deposed in 1845 for the much more politically astute Alexander Beresford Hope. But the drive to build a national style around medieval Gothic remained, indeed strengthened, under Beresford Hope. Other leading characters entered the fray. Gilbert Scott would come to the fore, not just as the most prolific Gothic architect, but as the leading advocate of a national style based on Gothic for all kinds of architecture. Ruskin, of course, joined in with his eloquence and attracted huge attention, as he still does. And for the other side, 
modernists such as Robert Kerr, who wrote The Alternative Seven Lamps, and James Ferguson, who Pevsner says matched Ruskin and the ecclesiologists for arrogance and rudeness. But back to this watercolor, because this is of the Crystal Palace, the great exhibition, the iconic example of engineering their buildings that did not collapse to the chagrin of some. Pettit would often ask whether the revival really captured the spirit of the age, or rather prophetically, he said, was doomed to gradually fail on its development to meet the views and exigencies of the present, i.e. match the inventiveness, industry, and dynamism of the Victorian age. Characteristically, as Gothic, Gothic got more entrenched for, for churches, Pettit went off for a year to France to search for perfect examples of round arch styles, a shorthand for different styles, at the boundary between the Latin South and the Gothic North, Tour, Loche, Poitiers, down to Bordeaux. That central region came to be called Angevin, with Romanesque architecture which flexibly harmonized a wide range of motifs. So domes, sloping roofs, flat roofs, pointed arches, round arches, different kinds of spires. The result, architectural studies in France, came out in 1854. Gavin Stamp pointed out that it was an influential book and Scott followed in his footsteps. That's the only modern reference to Pettit per Pettit as opposed to Pettit on the receiving end of criticism from the, the ecclesiologists or losing a battle with Gilbert Scott. These pictures, the previous and this and the next, are all from that book, as you can see by the illustrations. At one point, the weekly builder reports a mini battle of styles between Italian and Angevin. Italian, of course, proposed by several people, Venetian, Lombardian, and Pisan. But eventually, and to their credit, the High Victorians accommodated them all. Some satisfaction for Pettit, but not enough, because Gothic was still the main basis. So by 1855, the last stage of Pettit's involvement in the Battle of Styles begins. For the next 10 years, the battles were mainly fought out in the public lecture halls, <coughs> not so much with new points as with new arguments for old points, most of which were touched on or covered by Pettit in 1841. Sorry, I've got ahead of myself. By now, Reba was getting into its stride. It added its annual series of public lectures from 1856. And the Architectural School and Museum started a, another series of annual lectures. And all of these were not just re reviewed, but were reprinted in the builder, along with all of the angry letters. Pettit delivered at least eight of these major published lectures, as many as any of the leading figures on either side. His great attraction as a lecturer was partly his art. Reports described Reba's Hall by then in Conduit Street with 100 of his pictures pinned to the walls. Only sketches would not have worked, but landscapes and wider views would have been used and also carry his exhibition labels, little pieces of paper hanging down from the center. 100 pictures is the same number as I'm going to show you in the whole lecture, so imagine if they were all around. I think that's actually better than PowerPoint. I'm going to give you just three snippets from these lectures to give you a flavor of Pettit's pro progressivism although the lectures actually range quite widely. First of all, one called Utilitarianism in Architecture at the exhibition in 1856. Utilitarianism was a key debating point between the Goths and the Antigoths. Pettit delivered a lecture with that as its title, and he'd been illustrating the point since 1841. Utilitarian buildings were authentic. Swiss cottages worked in Switzerland, not in the UK. A building has to address its purpose first and foremost. And this quote, a studied picturesqueness, if not wholly valueless, is incomparably of less value than that which is inartificial. 
this may explain or um, uh, support the fact that Pettit never took artistic license in pictures after the 1830s, after 1830, in fact. More provocatively, Pettit praises the furnaces in the neighborhood of Wolverhampton, taken as buildings independently of their accompaniments of fire and smoke, are absolutely grand. That, I think, is Bilston in 1852 3, and I think it's the same as the first I showed you, which is on the left. And he continually points out the incongruity between the genius of the Victorian age and its pension for neo Gothic architecture. It is, I suspect, because this is not a cathedral building age that our genius seems to flag and languish when we attempt what is specially the architecture of cathedrals, i.e. were it not for the big churches, Gothic would never have become nearly as popular. While in our engineering works we display a power and a perception of architectural propriety not surpassed in the greatest works of the Romans. This isn't new, as we saw. It was a widely held position for secular architecture, but not in church architecture. Most opponents were willing to grant grant the Gothicists the churches if they would play with those and leave the rest alone. Let me jump to what Pevsner says about the 19th century. Why is it then that a hundred years had to pass before an original modern style was really accepted? How can it be that the 19th century remains smugly satisfied with the imitation of the past? <coughs> Unfortunately, this doesn't give credit to Pettit, to Pettit and the others who are saying the same thing either here in the outline of European architecture or in 19th century architectural writers. Pettit may be, uh, Pevsner may be one factor why the opponents may be less discussed than the supporters of Gothic now. But we should note that Pettit's modernism is very different from the tabula rasa 20th century modernism that Pevsner goes on to praise and Professor Carl recently calls a dystopia. For Pettit, our new style, when it comes, must contain much both of revived Italian and Gothic, revived Italian being Renaissance, of course. There were some attempts at the early part of the 20th century by conquering churches and others in secular architecture before for the following 60 or 70 years, there was this pure modernism. Until now, it's starting to become a lot more flexible. The last dimension of Pettit's thinking we need to touch on is his efforts at originality while harmonizing with the past. On occasion, he produced designs and had them got up by Thomas Hill to present to the architectural exhibition for architects to pick up and use as they wished. Uh, ones based on these churches, the top and the left are of a church in Corfu, the bottom in right, and he deliberately does designs based on that as examples of might be a, a nice, interesting, modern church in the UK. A few churches were built uh, with motifs set, uh, suggested by Pettit, but whether or not those have a connection is not clear. Be that as it may, there are two buildings that were definitely completed, his summer house in Upper London and the one small church in North Wales, St. Philip's at Cairdion. Sadly, the summer house with its remarkable viewing platform where you could see all the way down to Litchfield is no longer, but the church, I'm pleased to say, has just got a new lease of life. Last year it was upgraded to grade one and soon it should be handed over to the Friends of Friendless Churches to be cared for in perpetuity. The new listing reads, included at grade one for its special architectural interest as a highly unusual and distinctive church for its period, boldly original in its style and relationship with its landscape. I didn't write that. You can take it as an independent testimony from a very experienced group of examiners. So, in conclusion, with just these few highlights, I hope to have shown you that in both disciplines he can claim to be a significant historical figure. In architecture, those who built buildings 
obviously claimed first place, but as a commentator, Pettit is important as the first major advocate of conservative preservation for ancient buildings as the Gothic revival was getting going, as a major influence towards softening the extremes and broadening the repertoire of Gothic, and for advocating a progressive path for church architecture that might have been a great help to Anglicanism as society changed. But in art, I think he has a very much stronger case even, because here there's a real legacy, albeit just a fraction of what once was. A topographer combining accuracy and effect, a rare example of a modernist during the pre-Raphaelite ascendancy, and because of his authenticity, painting as he did, free from the constraints of the romantic market. Going beyond this, there is therefore a case that as a progressive in a historical age, Pettit has a claim to relevance today above that of many of his better known peers. Nowadays, art and architecture are dominated by novelty. 19th century historicists in both disciplines have very little to say to a modern age. Pettit's progressivism in architecture, on the other hand, building on and harmonizing with the past is directly relevant, and Pettit's art can be more readily appreciated by a modern generation than many of his contemporaries. So, Mr. President, let me end by thanking you again for the opportunity to reintroduce Pettit to the Society. Any help that the Society or individual fellows could provide to recover his reputation in academia or in bringing him to a wider audience would, I think, enrich our understanding of 19th century art and architecture in a way that has real meaning for the present. Thank you. Thank you.